Hey everybody and welcome back. So this is the continuation of the B36 I had designed and built and we're going to talk about the Bombay system today. But just as a little side note here, um, this airplane was built and sold many years ago and I got it 99% done. It was actually ready to be final painted and I sold it because I got uh, somebody offered me an incredible amount of money for the airframe. I kept all of the I kept all of the guts, the um, motors, radios, air systems, everything inside it I kept uh, because it's going to become a huge static model. And um, sometimes I wish I wouldn't have sold it, but I did. And that's a fact. I know there's some of the haters out there that wish I would have flown it. I totally get that. But I just needed the money and nobody's funding my hobby but me. So rock on. So let's get into this, okay? Um, so, if you're new to my channel, please like and subscribe because I'm trying to build my YouTube. Um, I am a model aircraft nut, but I'm also a full-scale pilot, but it's too expensive to fly full-scale, so I'm actually building an ultralight, too. But, um, the B-36 was my dream airplane, and I spent about a couple of, I spent about a year and a half in CAD uh, designing it and trying to figure out how all the parts and pieces would work. And um, I would say overall the plane turned out absolutely kick-ass. But what I've learned in the 12 years since I designed it is just mountains and mountains of skills, experiences. Um, if you followed me, you know I fly my electric MSL-2 that's 188 inches. And I've been flying the MSL-1 before that, which was 197 inches. And, and all the techniques I've learned... It's really helped me understand that on the next one I build, it's going to be a lot lighter, uh, which it was already extremely light, and it's just going to be a lot easier. So if you don't know the backstory on this, hopefully that's kind of it. So <clears throat> in this one, we're going to talk about the Bombay. And the thing about the Bombay that was the, to me, the most important part was have scale Bombay doors. And uh, the B-36 had fast-acting doors um, that actually, um, they were really quick, actually. If you watch some of the different video that was out there, I'm not sure why they made them go so quick unless they just wanted to open the doors, drop the bombs, and close the doors when they're, like, on their bomb run. But there was a lot of geometry in this design. And um, I don't want to say this was hard, but it was so time-consuming that... It, it was more frustrating because I was using a lot of cardboard cutout and T-pins and measuring radiuses and trying to get it all to work. Now, this is before I had my Fusion 360, but I did have 3DS Max, which I could animate. Okay, and if you watch at the end of this, I'll put some video at the very end of this once I'm done with this of some of the testing I did on this. And some of it's 10 or 12 years old, so the video is not the greatest quality. Uh, but the 3D animations are pretty cool. But my whole goal on this was to activate it with servos and get it to work scale. So it ended up taking eight servos just to run the two Bombay doors. Two servos on the front of the door, two on the, well, two on the front of door one and two, two on the rear of door one and two. Okay, because there's two Bombays. Before we get too deep, I want to talk about my awesome sponsor. It's RTL Fasteners. Um, if you need like 440 um, bolts, nuts, blind nuts, or 256, or any of the usual suspects, or you need washers, uh, lock washers, you need nylocks, uh, you need servo screws to hold in your servos, or any type of wood screw, go to their website, look at what they've got. It's really cool. If you see a bunch of stuff you want, order more than $50, and use code DA30, the top secret code DA30, and you'll get 30% off that order over $50 fantastic company to work with so this is looking into the Bombay and this was a cluster okay I mean with what I've learned this will be totally different but I had four receivers in it I had a massive air system because the landing gear weighed about 20 pounds so I needed a huge volume of air and pressure to get the main landing gear uh, and that's the main landing gear well, well actually the entire landing gear on a scale weighed about 20 pounds for this airplane the, and including the air system. 
So <clears throat> there is so much I will redo in the future. But the Bombay, I knew I wasn't going to be dropping fake bombs out of this airplane. Um, one of the things about dropping bombs, and I've dropped fake bombs from model airplanes, is you have too much of a tendency when you drop them to lose focus on flying the airplane. And with this airplane going to be 250, uh, 257 inch wingspan, um, I already knew it would be a lot of responsibility to fly a 110 pound airplane, 120 pound airplane. Um, with that kind of wingspan. I didn't want to ever maybe open and close the Bombay doors as I fly by. That would have been cool. But to actually be dropping fake nukes and stuff, <clears throat> it was never my intent. So my first challenge was figuring out how do I mount the servos in there and keep everything light. So I cut these out. And this uh, right here is the very forward uh, of the door number one uh, toward the nose. That's where two servos are going to be mounted. This was the mid part of the airplane, which is the rear of door one, the front of door two. And then this is the rear of door two. So those were going to hold servos. When it comes to the linkage I had to make, this is what, um, to me, this is therapy. I love doing this. A lot of people say, how can you hand cut every part of this airplane and not get anything laser cut? Well, the, the, the best answer is I can't afford a laser cutter. And I'm not going to send it all to be laser cut because there's so many times that I will recut parts to get it right. Very rarely, well, I shouldn't say very rarely, I would say 20% of the time, <clears throat> I'll cut a part out, see how it fits, realize I don't like it. I'll go back into CAD, adjust it a little bit, recut the part again and go, that's it. So, um, but it's just cutting these out with my bandsaw and taking the time to get it right, to me, is therapy. Okay, sure, it takes just amazing amount of time to get it right, uh, or not to get it right, just to, to, to do it, okay? And you've gotta make sure your band saw, you got the right blade, it's sharp and all that junk, or you're just going to be burning wood. But ultimately, this is what a lot of the parts and pieces look like. And as you can tell, there is a lot of crap going on inside just the parts to build these four doors was insane. This was me just putting a, now keep in mind, every bit of this airplane except bulkheads and hard points was balsa wood. So as you can see, the, the little ribs on this are a light ply from Aircraft Spruce, it's eighth inch, and the hard points are ply, but everything else <clears throat> I try to keep balsa wood. And if the balsa wood needs a little bit of tensile strength, I will laminate some carbon fiber toe on it. If you watch my other videos, you know I love to do that. So here was <clears throat> me test fitting on my drawing. This is another thing I do all the time. If I'm gonna put a mechanism together, I will glue my paper to a piece of um, drywall. And I will drill the drywall out and put the piece on the drywall and mechanically test it on that piece of drywall right there. So this whole thing is on drywall or it's on a shelf. I, I can't remember if I use drywall or a shelf here. This might have been that uh, half inch shelf, that particle board shelf you can buy at Menards. But it holds everything in place so you can kind of test geometry. Once I knew this was right, I then put it into the airplane and just make sure that the geometry is right, that everything's moving right. Okay, C keep in mind, just because it worked in a 3D environment doesn't mean it will... <laughs> It should work, but I found out sometimes it just doesn't fit because let's say my 3D environment is down to a tenth of a millimeter accuracy. When I built this fuselage, who knows if I got something off just a little bit. I try not to, but you just don't know. <clears throat> and then that's the door swinging all the way back. This was me test fitting the first mock-up door. And here's another thing. If you followed me for many years, you know I'll always be able to mock-up, but if the mock-up turns out perfect then it becomes flight hardware. But I always start every mechanism thinking it's a mock-up. Um, that way, first of all, I don't get mad at myself if I screw up because I've called it a mock-up. But secondly, it just gives me more room to cut and sand and whittle on it. And if I ruin it, I know it was a mock-up and I go to the you know 2.0 version. This is still me testing some geometry as a, as a full door. 
and this is what it looks like down on the side of the airplane. Now keep in mind, the real B-36 doors worked almost exactly like this, but they were a lot thinner because they're all aluminum and magnesium. With balsa wood, I had to make things bigger uh, and with plywood just to be able to get screws to go through pivot points and stuff. So while the real B-36 door was really flat when it opened up, mine isn't that flat because I couldn't use materials that would use screws small enough. Okay, this is the two doors laying in there being tested. This is my hinge point, which was really cool and it worked really, really well. So now we talk about the linkage and this was 100% in my mind gonna be a mock-up. And this is the linkage that's gonna run from the servos to the doors that's gonna open and close the doors. And one of the things I want to tell you if you're ever going to scratch build, make sure when you do the circles that you're, where you're going to drill like a 440 hole, that you put a target in there. Okay, put the crosshairs in there. So you can take your center punch and put just a little, you know, dent in it. So when you run your drill through it, because I needed all of these, <clears throat> excuse me, um, holes to be virtually perfect. And, you know, I'm hand drilling all of this. So I cut this out on my bandsaw. I take the center punch and make sure I've got those perfect little dents so that when I run like a really small, and I'm talking like a 30 second drill bit or even smaller, through there's my pilot hole. When I then drill the regular hole I need for the 440, then everything is as close as I can humanly get it. And um, this is all the parts of the mock-up. <laughs> this is all the pieces. So they're gonna activate the, the four doors. And this is what the mechanism is going to look like on the um, door itself. And, uh, but I, I want to share something though about scratch building. Okay. One of the things that I have found in life is you're always going to have the backseat driver or, and you may not know the story, but Einstein, at least I don't know if this is true, but I've heard it from so many different professors that Einstein wrote down 10 equations on a big chalkboard. He intentionally left the last one wrong. Most of the people in the room noticed the last one wrong. And he goes, yeah, but you didn't notice the first nine were right. Okay. So I live in a world. Um, <laughs> I live in a world where many times I will be building something and somebody will go, well, that, that's dumb or that's not right. And believe it or not, they, they're not in my head. They don't know where I'm going with this. Because when I was starting to post a lot of pictures of this, Back in the day, people were saying, well, you know, that doesn't look very scale. Well, of course it doesn't look scale. The rear airplane had aluminum magnesium everywhere. So if you're going to be a scratch builder, be prepared for people to just be stupid. Okay, don't let it slow you down. Don't let it deter you. If, if, you, if, you, if you know why you're doing something, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Okay, because one of the biggest challenges of my B-36 build was all the naysayers. And it did. Sometimes it got me down. Sometimes it would slow me down. Sometimes it made me want to give up. And um, but like I, there's a movie out there that says, don't judge me on my wins. Judge me on the times I failed because I haven't failed many times. But I just want people to realize when you're doing this kind of thing, especially with all this geometry, you're going to get it wrong three or four times. And even if you're trying to post a log on the internet of people watching you build it and they see some of your failures, there's going to be some people that are really rude and really mean. You know, I'm severely dyslexic. People would always point out my misspellings instead of, you know, looking at something cool I designed or something that worked. So um, just wanted to drop that tidbit because I got a lot of haters when I was designing these systems telling me this would never work and it worked. So now here is the door sheeted. Keep in mind, this was still gonna be a mock-up. And I had a real big problem with these doors staying straight because the moisture in the air was causing the balsa wood to do all kinds of funky things. And I knew I was gonna glass it and put it in a jig, um, but I was really worried that these doors would ever look right on the airplane. Um, but I, I had contingencies, at least I hope I did, and I did. So here is the first mock-up of the linkage down there. So that door is sheeted. Let me go back because you might not have noticed. If you look down in there, there's a servo with that mock-up arm on it. Okay. So um, right here. 
Okay, there's the mock-up arm, there's the servo. And these servos ended up going 180 degrees so it would lock the doors up or down, but I don't have that. That arm wasn't the right length yet for me to make that to go 180 degrees. And if you don't know what certain servos you buy, you can get the servo programmer going there and, and make it move 180 degrees. And high tech is awesome for that. This is the door opening. And that was basically how it was gonna work. That's the door fully open. And if you notice that servo has it locked now, there's no load on that servo at all. Because anytime it's it's straight linear like that, that, that servo is uh, not gonna have any load. So um, when we look at it from the outside, I want you to think also about the hinges. These hinges had to pivot around an axis that was inside the fuselage a little bit. So I had to leave little grooves there. I had people point out to me the real B36 didn't have that. Great, awesome. I, I was just trying to make these doors work the best I could humanly do it. And if they had better ideas, I would love them to show me their drawings because normally they don't have better ideas. And this is the door opening. You can see the hinge swings out of the skin right there, which I didn't care about. Uh, I thought it was pretty slick as not, personally. So here was the four mock-up doors, and I was really, at this point, excited with how they were working out. But I was also, like I said earlier, I was nervous of how they might deform because of moisture. And I kept thinking, once I glass that and seal it, and I have it in jig and let it cure over a day, it probably would be fine. And it was. Here's another picture looking down the inside of the fuselage. Here's a picture with the doors closed. And now what I want you to think about is all the space that's in this. So we're looking at it from the nose toward the back of the airplane. You see those air canisters I've got back there? Well, that was for the main gear, and I hated that. I hated the fact that when that door would open, people would look in there and they would possibly see all this garbage. So imagine me doing a big flyby with it, with the door open, showing off the Bombay doors. I didn't want people to see that. So I don't remember where this idea came from. I think it came from one of my followers on RC groups, because I don't remember having this idea. And normally I remember when that little spark goes off in this little bitty pea brain I got. But I don't remember, I think somebody on RC group says, hey, Damon, why don't you disguise those air tanks as nukes? So this is my daughter. Now, you know she's 20 now. It's just how long ago this was. But that's her holding an air tank that I painted to look like nukes. So here's all the air tanks for the main landing gear looking like nukes. I built this complete cluster freak of a bomb hanging rack that weighed 10 billion pounds. This is the dumbest thing I've ever designed right here. It weighed so much it was stupid. I was excited with it until I picked it up and held it and thought, crap, I can't put this in this airplane. This thing is a turd. But I decided, okay, let's put it in there just as a bomb rack, just to hold the bombs so I could just see what it would look like in there. So I put the bombs in, hooked up the air tanks, and said, I like this. This is going to be really cool. So then I went and designed, designed the real linkage. Because remember I told you originally I had mock-up linkage. So this is what the linkage is going to look like. So that at least the part visible by anybody outside the airplane would look like those big aluminum tubes that Row B36 uses to activate the doors. So the, this was going to be the permanent uh, way I would activate the doors. And here you can see that, that one right down here. So this would be all painted silver. But basically, when the door would be open, anybody that could see in there would see this tube here and this tube here. Now, this was too short. This piece right here was too short for me to really put tubes on it and get it to work. But at least this would all be silver and would look somewhat right, I would hope. And this is what it looked like with all the servos hooked up with all the doors activating like i said at the end of this i will show you some video this was bomb rack 2.0 which didn't weigh anything i mean that first one was such a turd um i just used some balsa wood no one's going to see up in there i don't know what i was thinking when i built that first bomb rack um this is another thing about scratch building there's nothing wrong with having bad ideas Okay, there's nothing wrong with having an idea that you put it together and say, oh, crap, that was a turd. 
because you learn from that, okay? I, I, you know, everybody says you have to fail to succeed. I hate that because every time you fail, you're wasting money. So for me, I hate building five mock-ups and thinking about, man, I should have just flushed $150 down the toilet. Um, but that's the reality of scratch building sometimes. So when it was done, all six air tanks was in the aft Bombay. Uh, the front Bombay was also going to have a couple of fake ones to cover up all that uh, air system and, and receivers up there. Now, this was my attempt at first to get the doors to be completely square and straight. I put some carbon fiber toe in places and it worked. And once I glassed it, it was fine. Uh, the doors were fine. They didn't bow at all. Um, and in Indiana, we have a lot of humidity going up and down. So that was one of the things that concerned me about these doors. So that's basically it, everybody. Once I say bye and sign off here, I'll put on the back of this some video and some animation of this. But the Bombays, um, I don't want to say they were hard. I don't want to say they were the most technical part of this airplane because everything about this airplane had hidden challenges, okay? And I was really... Um, I probably won't redesign the Bombay doors much on the um, 2.0, except I'm going to 3D print almost all the hardware for it. If you watch the fuselage update video, I'm going to 3 I'm going to have to weigh them, but I'm going to try to 3D print all the bulkheads that go through the fuselage. And I think it's a terrific idea because, of course, it's my idea, but I think it's going to really be cool in the airplane. And when you think about everything I can 3D print now, um, the B-36 2.0, and I don't know if I should even call it that, because um, I, I, that sounds, my next B-36 is going to have so much different that I've learned in 12 years, um, and I won't sell that, okay? Just like I've been offered a boatload of money for the MSL-1 and the MSL-2, I have decided I'm not selling any more airplanes. Now, if somebody walks up and says, hey, I love that 188-inch airplane. I'm going to give you $20,000 for it. It will be in your trailer quicker than I can say thank you and have a great day. But no one's going to give me $20,000 for the MSL-2. Everybody has a price, okay? So look, everybody, I'm going to cut this off now because I could talk forever. Um, the next video, we're going to dive into the wing. And the wing might be a two-parter because there was a wing 1.0 and a wing 2.0. And the wings were the most frustrating part of this entire project. Um, and then we'll get into all the parts and pieces of the wing. Okay? So rock on, everybody. Have an awesome day. Please like and subscribe. If you've watched the video this long, you must really give a crap and you like what I'm doing. So please like and subscribe and share my videos. See you next time. Rock on and be safe. Take care.